class, let's begin. Um, reminder about uh, a homework that's due tomorrow. Homework five is uh, available on Canvas. It's entirely, uh, there's no programming. It's just asking you to step through uh, Adaboost and you get two attempts. I think I've fixed all the problems with visibility and such things on uh, Canvas, but you know, with Canvas, you never know. Um, any questions about this? I know that many of you have already finished it and or not, but are there any questions? Yes. Um, I have a question about your last question. Um, question about if a student is wearing a right. Uh, here, but like, is there any that students in students that could have this package before doing something with the inputs? For that data. Yeah. So it's, it's about that specific data. So I think if I remember the question right, it's about it's asking if if uh, there's a decision tree whose depth is three. If ID three can does it talk about ID three or does the question explicitly say? I, oh, okay. So okay, okay. So imagine that there's a decision tree learner that is like the perfect one. Um, and imagine that your data is produced by some adversary, meaning your test set can be arbitrarily different or not. Um, you don't get to control that. Now the question is, can there be a tree of depth three, at most three, I think, that gets zero training error or uh, there are four options there, yeah. And it does not talk about any specific learner. Right? I don't know if I answered your question because uh, I interrupted you. So maybe you can continue. Um, I guess I'm interested in this about, but I guess it's a thing that's really good. I guess it's a couple of years to work on things and the legal and interest also like given the data like so uh, given the data, it's it's the second one. Given this data, uh, not like any arbitrary data set, but given this data that you have, can you say something? Yeah, we are comparing different algorithms on this data set. Other questions? Yes. Does that include on the the given outputs or like the test set? No, the test set. Does the question say anything about the uh, given? I remember it may not be that question you're talking about, but a different question that said, is there a tree that trains perfectly for the test and that it's the same one? It's uh yeah. so the, the question is is it that given test set or any test set? Uh when I wrote the question, I intended any test set, uh, but I don't know what the words were, uh, but I intended any test set. Other questions? There's also the project milestone too. Uh, it's due next week, April 7th is next week, right? Um, so that requires two more submissions to Kaggle and uh, a, just you know a checkpoint to make sure that things are going smoothly. Uh, so you can submit like a report on Canvas that literally just a collection of bullets if you want of uh, what you've done since the previous milestone um what kinds of problems if any that you faced and what you plan to do going ahead going ahead just be aware that uh, your next homework and i'm telling you this so that you can plan your project also so next homework is so oh, there's a question on the uh, i'll come back to the zoom question yeah. after this your next homework is going to be about uh, implementing support vector machines and uh, logistic regression so you may factor that into your project plans also the other thing is that uh, for your project implementation, just be aware that uh, when I said you can use four different algorithms, you can use, uh, you know, ensembles count as different algorithms. So you can implement a some sort of bagging or boosting type strategy, and that way you can construct new uh, classifiers. So make a plan and, you know, just tell us what you want to do going ahead. Uh, there's a question on Zoom, and then I'll come back to the project. 
uh, about the previous uh, question about the test set. What assumptions do we make about the test set? You can't assume anything about the test set because uh, all you know is that uh, it comes from the same distribution as the train data, but that's it. You can't control anything else. Um, questions about the project or the, the yeah, the project milestone. Yes. Um, for the two submissions, we can two submissions that could be one by two one three and using assignment. Could be anything. Mm -hmm. Um you remember the project had a bunch of uh, rather intricate rules. Uh and subject to those rules, two submissions. And some of you already had those two submissions before for project milestone one already, and you can just say that I submitted them on such and such date. Yeah. Uh, for the batch maintenance, so we need six in the end, right? You need and six in the end. Like, only, no, not neural net. Only one of them can use a machine learning library. It doesn't have to be neural net, it could be anything. So, let's just pause for a second. Let's say for the first one, we did like neural networks, and then we wanted to get like convolution learning. Would we have to use that and two others for this? I'm confused. So, well, there's only one submission and using its own genome. Yes. And we've already used that one for our first one. Yes. We use it a different algorithm. So, if you already use that up, then for the, your remaining submissions should be stuff that you've implemented on your own. Yeah. Did you have a question? For me? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. At the end, you can. At the end, you get uh, you get to go go back and pick six things. Maybe you want to do six fresh submissions because you don't like anything that you did so far. Yes, it's fine. For the second submission, you can say, "Oh, I don't have to." Yeah, yeah. Basically, I just want some activity on the project front, and I don't want them all to pile up. At the end, because I was telling someone else, uh, uh, you know, we are coming close to the end of the semester, and there's going to be like a huge pileup of deadlines at the end of the semester. Let me just scare you into uh, uh, getting your project done yourself. There is the project that needs to be done. You need to write a project report that's due on, I think, the last exam day. There's, of course, the final exam. There's homework number six that's going to be due sometime soon. Homework six involves a lot of implementation, so that's going to take some time. And to put them all in place, we have what three weeks, uh, three or four weeks. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a marathon for both of us, for you to do all the work, for me to grade all the work. Uh, but uh, just be aware that there's going to be all that. That's the reason why I'm kind of, uh, you know, spreading the project work over the semester so that you. Uh, it doesn't accumulate at the end, and also it allows you a second chance to revisit the stuff that you've implemented. It's not from my computer, is it? Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? Any other comments about the projects or such things? Now we're going to do two topics today. Um, Yes, I'm being ambitious. Uh, the first one's kind of a quick one because we've actually seen this idea multiple, a few times already. I just want to put them together into one place so that it, it's an important idea that you need to see in one place. And this is the uh, the idea about uh, of, of framing learning, the, the, the task of machine learning as minimizing loss, or sometimes it's called risk or empirical risk, or regularized risk. So, uh, the, what I'm going to talk about here can be seen as a generalization of the stuff that we saw with support vector machines, with uh, uh, least mean square regression, and it turns out a whole bunch of other learning, uh, you know, learning uh, uh, ideas. And in some sense, this is a standard sort of abstraction that's used when we want to build models today. And this idea becomes important when we, uh, you know, for instance, with neural networks and such things, this is the idea that's implemented. So we are given 
some examples that are that uh, for the sake of analysis and only for that sake and not in practice we'll assume are drawn from a fixed and unknown distribution there is some oracle classifier or a regressor uh, we'll call that f that labels these examples so what you get is a list of pairs um, that can do that but or in general there is like a function a hidden function that we seek to find our goal is to find uh, find the function f or at least a good enough approximation that we will call h this so far we've changed you know this is standard machine learning setup in a perfect world what we would want to do is find the function h that is the least bad to do that what we we'll, you know that seems like a overly pessimistic way of saying it because uh, uh, but you know the, 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 I, I don't know I didn't make up these words so what we'll do is uh, we'll define the badness of hypotheses using a function that we'll call L L for loss L is the loss function the loss function penalizes hypotheses for their predictions on the training data or their predictions on uh, examples in general uh, penalizes uh, hypotheses for differing from f our goal is to uh, find the uh, hypothesis that has the lowest loss but not so ideally we would like not just lowest loss but the lowest expected loss expectation over all possible examples uh, over, over uh, the expectation over examples drawn from that distribution of let's say loss of h of x something like that so the examples are drawn from the fixed distribution that we do not actually have access to of course well, i've already written that more neatly here so uh, we can frame learning as minimizing the expected loss um, over this distribution unfortunately we do not have access to this distribution we don't know what the distribution is so instead what we will do is we will sample from that distribution imagine that we have a process that we that does not actually tell us what the distribution is but gives us samples from that distribution that process does not really have a very clever name it's uh, you can call it uh, collecting a training data set so the process of collecting a training data set is nothing but sampling from this distribution because all training examples come from that distribution so rather than minimizing the expected uh, loss which we just don't have access to uh, we will minimize the empirical loss remember this expectation can be seen by the law of large numbers as uh, being approximated by this average loss over a collection of examples so instead of minimizing the expected loss we'll minimize the empirical loss on a sample from that distribution sample with m example that is, that sample is called the training set i'm not telling you anything new so far this is just using different words to describe what we've already seen hopefully you're seeing that point right now so we can frame the problem of learning as minimizing empirical loss on a training set empirical loss is simply the average of this loss average because i'm summing the loss over in the entire training data and dividing by m the number of examples so what's the problem here yes now let's say that we are minimizing the loss exactly let's say that we are not worried about how hard the minimization problem we're not generalizing but you were going to say something we're going to overfit that's right so three people agree so it must be right uh, so this is going to overfit and in fact let me give you a example of a function a hypothesis function that minimizes the expected loss and drastically overfit what this function does i'm calling this function the table classifier what it does is it takes the training data and puts them in a table when a new example comes in it checks is this example in my table if so then it will just return the label associated with that example 
If that example is not in the table, it will toss a coin. On every example in the table, it will get the perfect accuracy. Right? So that's, that is the mathematical minimizer of this loss, of this, uh, of this empirical loss. Of course, the table classifier is extremely complex from a VC dimension uh, type point of view, but that we'll not worry about that now. If we are minimizing the loss over all possible functions, we can't do better than that function because it's going to get zero loss on the training data. Of course, on any new example that it has not seen, that classifier is literally tossing a coin. So it's as good as random. So you can't do worse than that on future examples. So it is truly a terrible classifier, but it looks fantastic from this point of view. So the table classifier is bad because it is overly complex. It can explain, quote unquote, explain any data set. And oh, there's another uh, uh, comment on Zoom that the training data set may not be representative, which is also a, a difficult problem. The training data may not be representative of future examples. Now that is a more subtle problem, which we will not worry about right now. The real, so the answer to this question of, you know, overfitting here is uh, that we need some mechanism that prevents our learner from exploring ridiculous classifiers like the one I described. We need some mechanism that forces the learner to prefer simpler models, to prefer something that we already, to have some, to, to introduce some expectation that we may have about the classifier. One such expectation is simplicity, but it turns out there are a few others uh, that uh, that we may want. So we, the the mathematical object that introduces that preference in this learning process is a regularizer. The regularizer is a function. It's just a function that takes a classifier and returns a number. It doesn't take any data. It just takes a classifier and returns a number. And the num number it returns is larger for more complex classifiers. So we can think of the problem of learning as minimizing two things simultaneously. We want to minimize the empirical loss, of course, because we want to do well on the training data at least. In addition, we want to minimize complexity. The way we minimize complexity is by making the regularizer small. So we are trying to minimize two things. We are trying to minimize two things a natural way of doing that is to minimize the sum of those two things. And that gives us what's called regularized loss minimization or regularized risk minimization. Sometimes the word risk is also used here. In this case, we are minimizing, again, searching over all hypotheses in some hypothesis space, the sum of two things. The regularizer says prefer simpler hypotheses and the, the loss, the second term says preferred correct prefer the hypotheses that look more like F. And between them, and we would like to minimize both of them. We've, we've encountered this idea. This is a very general form of an idea we've already encountered. If your hypothesis H was actually a linear classifier, then the entire classifier is defined by just one vector, the weight vector. So we've already encountered with linear classifiers, this idea of one, a particular type of regularizer. The regularizer given a weight vector is just W transpose W. And it has this whole margin interpretation for why it, it imposes simplicity. I'm not gonna go into that again. So with linear classifiers, we could have Minimize the norm of the weight, the squared norm of the weight, plus some uh, hyperparameter C times the empirical loss. Now, the question is, uh, what loss function can we use? By the way, there are other regularizers we can use also, which impose other preferences. This is uh, the, the squared L2 distance. We could use this, the L1 distance. This is simply equal to sum of Wi squared. We could use just the L1 distance, which is the sum of the absolute values of the weights. 
That's another regularizer. Uh, in the literature, you might see this L1 regularizer, um, uh, especially with regression under the name of Lasso. Lasso is uh, uh, a regularizer, uh, regression with this particular regularizer, which actually has this very interesting property that it prefers sparsity in the parameters. It prefers weights to be zero if possible. Uh, just like the first one prefers weights to be small, but not necessarily zero. In any case, there are other regularizers also. Uh, and, the, you know, this is like a, this, the, you can just today in the best libraries, you can just add a regularizer easily. Question, yes. So, in the linear classifiers, without the regularizer, you do tend to, there is a preference to overfit. Uh, I'll give you a very extreme example. Um, some data sets that I've worked with have dimensionalities that are in the million. The data, the, the examples are million dimensional points. And in million dimensional, in million dimensions, if you have only a small number of examples, you might be able to find a linear separator no matter, um, you know, without trying too hard. And that will just overfit the data. So you want to impose a preference that says, don't try too hard to fit the data. You, you know, you need to, you have this other criterion also. Yes. <laughs> No, that's not true. There are I mean, don't, when you say we, as in in this class or in okay. Sure. Yes. He comes with that. It has that lineage. Yeah. Yeah, that's because of the theorem from Vapnik. You have to, it will be linear in some higher dimensional space. You can think about, you can do that, or you can actually think about uh, proving similar bounds in other places or using other measures of complexity beyond VC dimension. There's something called Rademacher complexity, which allows you to introduce regularization. So there are other more sophisticated versions of classifier complexity that uh, that can also themselves lead to regularizers and uh, you know the ways to build what uh, define these sort of risks um, in a perfect world it would be that simple in practice with like for instance with a lot of neural models today uh, the the standard operating procedure is not even to use a regularizer. Instead, there are certain other procedural approaches that introduce generalization rather than using a regularizer, like dropout. We've already encountered a procedural approach that favors generalization, namely averaging. Averaging is not a regularizer. Averaging is this sort of a procedure that I didn't tell you how, I didn't tell you why, but it lends itself to better regularization. So there are procedural uh, reg regularizers that exist. Dropout is one of them. And there's also this uh, uh, line of thinking that argues that just the act of using stochastic optimization is itself imposing a preference over certain kinds of models. Regularizer in general is just a strategy to impose a preference over certain types of models. If you have two classifiers that both have equal loss, which one would you pick? You need some sort of a tiebreaker. And the function that does that in an abstract sense is a regularizer. Okay, uh, yes. Rademacher, R A D E. Rademacher complexity. Okay, so we have this. Uh, this is all I'm saying about regularizers, but we still have that other term that I did not expand on, loss. Question is, what is a good loss function? A loss function is a function that penalizes mistakes. 
or more generally, it penalizes the hypothesis from for being different from the uh, true function on this example. And the goal is to minimize the average loss. That way, we are trying to push the hypothesis to be as similar as possible to the true functions. So, say that say we are doing binary classification. What's the ideal loss function? For when I say ideal, well, how do we measure? How do we evaluate classifier? What's the perfect loss function? Someone who's not answered so far. We've already encountered this before. Actually, you've been encountering this since the beginning of the semester. How do you penalize classifier? Uh, no, no, no. How do you how, think about evaluation? The loss function is supposed to be about evaluation. How do you evaluate the quality of a classifier on one example? How do you know that it's correct? Or just compare. Yeah, just compare. The, the, what do you compare? That's right. So you compare the true value of the, fun, the, of the function f of x against the predicted value of this hypothesis, h of x. If they are equal, you don't lose any points. If they are not equal, you lose one point. That's how you measure error of a classifier, right? You just take, you compare over, you do this comparison over an entire set of examples. You calculate how many points are lost, divide by the number of examples. That's the error of a classifier. So this particular uh, uh, thing has a much more fancy name. It's called the zero one law. The zero one loss is literally just a loss that penalizes classification error. If the ground truth y and the prediction y prime are different from each other, the loss takes a value one. If the ground truth and the uh, true value of the, 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 the true label uh, and the predicted label are the same, then the penalty is zero. So the zero one loss is simply uh, and I'm using this notation L01 uh, that takes two, two labels, Y and Y prime. One of them is the ground truth, the other one's the predicted, predicted one, and you just uh, check if they are equal. For linear classifiers, um, we can think of zero one loss as uh, exactly this expression here. Minimize, sorry, not minimize. So the, the prediction is simply the sign of W transpose X. And when when the uh, the sign of W transpose X and the ground truth, let's say Y, have different signs, then this quantity is negative. So for linear classifiers, I could say the zero one loss is exactly the same as the function that gives the value one if Y W transpose X is equal to is negative and it gives the value zero when Y W transpose X is positive. This is the this is the loss function we would like to minimize because this is how we evaluate our classifiers. This is you measure accuracy, assuming that you're measuring accuracy. There are other things you can measure also, like precision and recall. But if you're measuring measuring accuracy, this is the function that you'd like to minimize because, in some sense, this is the way in which your classifier is going to be graded. So it makes sense to optimize this exact thing. Unfortunately, minimizing the zero one loss is computationally intractable, which means we need surrogates for the zero one loss. You, we've seen this picture before. Uh, the zero one loss, if I plot it uh, against y w transpose x, it uh, has this form. When y w transpose x is positive, um, the zero one loss is zero. When y w transpose x is negative, the zero one loss is one. Higher is worse here. Just remember, higher is worse because higher means more mistakes, worse model. Questions about the zero one loss? Yes? What does intractable mean? Intractable means it's computationally infeasible. Uh, the computational complexity of minimizing zero one loss is too high. Other questions? Okay, so we'd like to minimize this, but we can't. And so we have to find some, you know, the, the, the oldest trick in any sort of a modeling uh, handbook is 
If you have a phenomenon that's too difficult to model for whatever reason, you approximate. You find some approximation. You find some surrogate that you rather you solve instead. And if that surrogate is good enough or has interesting properties, it will behave like the thing that you want to model. So one surrogate that we've already seen is the hinge loss. The hinge loss is a surrogate loss uh, that is that offers you know more the uh, more attractive computational properties. In particular, it gives you a convex loss function, and it can be optimized using uh, gradient-based methods. The hinge loss has, while the zero-one loss says everything on this side is good and everything on this side is bad, and on the bad side, no matter what the value of y w transpose x is, it's all equally bad. What the hinge loss says is actually you'd like to think about uh, three different play regions. Uh, when y w transpose x is more than one, no penalty. When y w transpose x is less than zero, the penalty keeps growing linearly as y w transpose x gets more and more, uh, as that quantity gets bigger or lower. And, in this region, when the value of y times w transpose x is positive but less than one, on one hand, we know that the classifier has made the correct prediction because y and w transpose x have the same sign. It's positive. Yet, it is too close to the margin. You still impose a penalty. You still treat this as a mistake, this region here. You still treat this region as a mistake and uh, impose a penalty. Of course, not as big a penalty as it is in this region. But still, there is an increasing penalty as the example is placed closer and closer to the mark. We, we kind of spent a fair amount of time on this. So I'm not going to uh, revisit this in the interest of time. But minimizing the hinge loss gives us support vector machines. I could have introduced the idea of support vector machine in a completely different way. I could have said, the goal of learning is to minimize loss. I would like to minimize the zero one loss, but I don't know how to do it. Instead, I'm going to introduce an approximation called the hinge loss that has these properties there. There's your support vector machine. So that's just another sort of an origin story, if you will. Um, there are many variants of the hinge loss. There's a square hinge loss. There's like multiple uh, minor variants of the hinge loss also, but this is the one that is the most common one. With the SVM objective, when we plug all the pieces in, we get... Uh, the regularizer plus the empirical loss. In the SVM, the empirical loss is the hinge loss, which penalizes weight, vector, weight vectors according to that particular, uh, you know, according to the way the function is defined. It turns out that you could replace that loss function with other kinds of losses. You won't have an SVM anymore, but if your loss function makes sense, maybe you have a meaningful classification or a learning setting. On the regularizer side, you have uh, uh, the squared norm, W transpose W, which uh, in, in this case, it, it pushes for maximizing the margin, but in general, like all regularizers, it imposes a preference over the hypothesis space in the absence of any data or when there are equal, uh, you know, as a tiebreaker, if you will. This regularizer can also be re replaced with other regularizers. You'll get other variants of SVM if you use the same other regularizers with the hinge loss, you get L1 regularized hinge loss, for example, or things like that. And there are, you know, numerous variants. There's like an entire cottage, cottage industry around inventing regularizers also. These two terms kind of behave at odds with each other. The regularizer says, imagine that you did not have this term at all. You only had the regularizer. And you're trying to minimize it. You're saying minimize W transpose W. Two things. First, minimizing W transpose W is basically saying, I'm throwing away the entire data set. I'm ignoring the entire data set because the data doesn't even figure in the objective. Second, what is the minimum value of W transpose W? Zero. So if you minimize W transpose W, you're saying the weight vector is going to take the zero value. If the weight vector takes, it's like all zeros, uh, I'll let you think about it offline. It corresponds to having an infinite margin. 
So it's like over generalizing. Alternatively, another way of thinking about it is in the absence of any data, this regularizer prefers setting all the weights to zero. In the absence of any evidence, it doesn't want to assign a non-zero weight to any feature. Because why should that feature show up if there's no evidence in the data? So that's the way you can explain this regularizer. Let's take the other extreme where this term doesn't exist and all you have is the loss function. So you don't have any regularizer. We already discussed this. Minimizing the loss function uh, without any regularization can lead to overfitting. So what we have here is on this side, you have overfitting. On this side, you have what is called underfitting, not, ca not uh, characterizing the data well enough. Neither of these are good. You'd like to balance these two things, and that's what this hyperparameter C does. The hyperparameter says these two things have to be balanced just right so that I get the right classifier. How do you find the best value of the hyperparameter? Cross validation. So, a lot of modern machine learning is a massive cross validation enterprise, or at least some sort of hyperparameter tuning enterprise. Questions? Like I said, this is not new. This is just a different look at the same topic. Yeah. You also want the function to be convex, or at least for now. When we come to neural network, I'll toss out all rules and say, like, you know, let's see what happens if we pretend that convexity didn't matter. And at that point, you can do all sorts of loss functions. Feel free to invent your own. But for now, we want it to be convex. I keep saying there are many loss functions. You can replace the empirical loss, the, the what do you call this thing, the, uh, the hinge loss with all sorts of variants. Here's a few examples. Um, the perceptron algorithm can be seen as minimizing what's called the perceptron loss. And I'll show you pictorial versions of all of them. And I'm not going to read the math. You can just look at it on your own. SVM minimizes the regularized hinge loss. Turns out the addaboost algorithm that we saw, which was introduced as a solution to this weak learner, strong learner question, can be seen as minimizing the, some, a particular loss called the exponential loss over all the weak learners. Uh, logistic regression, which we haven't yet encountered, also minimizes a certain loss function. We will derive this later called the logistic loss. If you prefer pictures, here's all of them in one slide. So you have the zero one loss, which is not uh, computationally uh, easy to uh, optimize. So you, we have the hinge loss, which we, uh, which is the SVM. The perceptron loss is basically the same as the hinge loss, but just shifted, and that way you don't have the margin anymore. The exponential loss is uh, something that imposes a very heavy penalty on the classification. It grows exponentially. Logistic regression is another loss that many, uh, that also uh, is a surrogate. It's also a smooth surrogate, and you know there are many many other loss functions. Uh, I have zoomed in here between, if you notice, minus two to two. Uh, a fun exercise is to zoom out. Uh, if you plot this, I plotted this on Desmos, this kind of online graphing software. If you plot this, all of these on Desmos and zoom out quite a bit, it will be hard to tell the difference between them. Only the zero one loss stays at the bottom. Everything else kind of looks very similar. Yes. That is one way of arguing for it. The, the correct loss, if you care about accuracy, is the zero one loss. And the rest of them are supposed to be surrogates that we use because we can't solve the zero one loss optimization. Uh, as a comment there, though, the zero one loss is the ideal loss if you care about accuracy. Sometimes we might measure other things like uh, metrics like precision and recall and such things, and they don't, they look different. So, you know, you, the, the, um, the argument changes slightly. Yeah. Is there a loss function 
that uses like a sigmoid and stays like where the zero one is. Something like this? Yeah. So that's not convex. Oh, I see. Yeah. All of these are convex surrogates of the zero one law. All right. So that's pretty much all this unit is because it's a rather quick point, but a very important one. We've already seen this in a, quite a bit of detail, but the idea of learning as loss minimization is a pervasive one across machine learning today. It gives you a recipe for inventing new learning algorithms. The way you do that is you do not invent new learning algorithms. Instead, you invent new loss functions. You write down a loss function, you minimize the empirical loss, you add a regularizer to avoid overfitting, you figure out which uh, optimizer to use, a uh, good one to start off with is stochastic gradient descent. And uh, you know this is a widely applicable concept. I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, there are other strategies for introducing, uh, to, for avoiding overfitting like dropout that are quite popular these days. We'll talk about dropout right after we finish neural networks. Questions? Questions about this quote unquote recipe for building models or learning algorithms? Notice, by the way, that here in this slide, I did not say anything about this particular kind of a classifier or that particular hypothesis space or anything. You can write down your loss function, whatever your hypothesis space might be. Yeah. So, if you make, if you make learning algorithms that you care about accuracy for, like, I guess that I guess we haven't talked about a, a different kind of loss that's not a zero one loss. Well, all of these are not zero one loss. Well, but they're all what we're doing instead of that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's like a different fundamental type of loss or something else that we're trying to do. So it turns out that the rest of them are actually pretty hard and they don't, uh, they're not really nice to teach in a class. And so you write research papers about them. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, instead of a zero one loss, suppose the thing I care about is uh, I, I only care, the zero one loss is symmetric with respect to uh, two kinds of mistakes, predicting a positive as a negative or a negative as a positive. What if I care about one side of it much more than the other? Mm -hmm. Then you don't have a zero one loss anymore. You have to kind of tweak the whole thing and you have to think about the problem. That's just one example. And this is only for like Yes, everything here is for classification, but this is not for classification. This recipe applies for regression. In fact, we encountered this idea through regression for the first time, where the loss function was a squared loss. The natural loss function for regression is typically the squared loss, where you have two numbers and you want them to be close to each other. You take the difference and take the square and you want to minimize that. Other questions? Any thoughts? No, I told you, right? Uh, it could be the one norm, for example. Ridge regression uses, sorry, lasso uses the one norm. You could still use the one norm. I mean, it's worth thinking about how to do the optimization for it. Oh, I see, even with more complicated things. You could, yeah, it imposes a certain, imposes a certain preference and uh, it can be a little bit tricky to calculate and optimize that, but you could do that. Yeah, you could, yeah. But in general, people don't do that anymore because it, because the dropout idea is so easy to kind of incorporate into your, the, uh, the gradient calculation that uh, it's just completely.